All right, turn your Bible, if you would, to uh, Exodus 16. Exodus 16. And before we uh, look at the scripture, and we're going to be jumping around, not jumping, we'll go in a sequence, but uh, I guess you could call it jumping, but we're going to be turning to some scripture. Uh, a lot of different scriptures tonight um, as we open the Word of God and study it. And uh, so turn to Exodus 16, and before we look at the scripture, let's open a word of prayer. Dear God, we thank you so much for everything you've done for us. I thank you for your words. I thank you for your blood. And I pray that you uh, give me the grace and the help that I need to uh, make plain the sense of these things uh, tonight. Keep the devils away. Keep us safe. I claim your blood on the service. It's in Jesus Christ's name I pray. Amen. Now, turn your Bibles to Exodus 16 and look down at verse 30. Uh, we're going to read verses 30 through 35 in a moment. Um, but before I do, um, I'm not sneaking up on you. I'm going to tell you right off the bat what we're studying. And that is this matter of testimony and what testimony means. And so by way of introduction, uh, you always hear everybody talking about your testimony and how you should keep your test, keep a good testimony and have a good testimony. And what they mean is to keep an appearance of righteousness uh, for yourself in the presence of your brothers and sisters in Christ and of the world. Now, uh, the Bible, there's nothing wrong with doing right. Amen. <laughs> Nothing wrong with doing right. Uh, but when it comes to this matter of testimony, the word is grossly misused um, by Christians and preachers alike. Christian preachers, that's uh, I, mean, I mean to say. Because, well, the first way I said it implies that some preachers aren't Christians, which I'm sure is true. I'm talking about safe folks, though, tonight who misuse the word testimony. Now, um, testimony, they always, they always use it in a, in a, in a way that means uh, that you conform uh, to their idea of what it is to be a Christian, which 90% of the time is not Bible Christianity. Uh, having a good testimony is, has to do with uh, tithing. It has to do with church attendance. It has to do with um, uh, you know, keeping keeping yourself clean and unspotted from the world, and some of those things are good and right. It's good to go to church, amen. Uh, if it's a good church where there's a preaching of the word of God, and it's good to give, although it's it, uh, you're not commit you're not under the law, and so tithing is not a New Testament doctrine. Um, but. We're going to look tonight at what the Bible says about testimony and what testimony means, how it's defined in the Word of God, and, there, and then how we should apply it uh, to the way that we live our lives and the way that we speak. Um, so let's start with the first mention, uh, Exodus 16, look down at verse 30, 30. So the people rested on the seventh day, and the house of Israel called the name thereof manna. And it was like coriander thereof, manna. And it was like coriander seed, white, and the taste of it was like wafers made with honey. Then Moses said, This is the thing which the Lord commanded, fill an omer of it to be kept for your generations, that they may see the bread wherewith I have fed you in the wilderness when I brought you forth from the land of Egypt. So before we go on to the next verse, just get the fact that the reason why uh, the Lord commanded to fill an omer with this uh, manna was so that future generations would see the very bread that he fed them with in the wilderness. It's something he wanted them to know about. It's something he wanted to see. And he provided evidence for it with this omer uh, full of manna, to be kept for your generations, he said. 
that I fed you with in the wilderness when I brought you forth from the land of Egypt. And Moses said unto Aaron, Take a pot and put an omer full of manna therein, and lay it up before the Lord to be kept for your generation. So it's something that's meant to be kept. And this example, specific example here is the bread that he fed them with in the wilderness, which is a type of the word of God, Deuteronomy 8, uh, Matthew chapter 4, Luke chapter 4. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God doth man live. And the Bible says over in Deuteronomy 8, that is the reason why he fed, a, he fed the children of Israel with manna in the wilderness. That's the reason why he made them go around to and fro and suffer so that they could learn that man doth not live by bread alone but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of god all right look at verse 34 as the lord commanded moses that's referring to the command he just made 30 31 32 as the lord commanded moses so aaron laid it up before the testimony to be kept and the children of israel did eat manna uh, 40 years until they came to a land inhabited they did eat manna until they came into the borders of the land of canaan now an omer is the tenth part of an ephah in case you didn't know <laughs> so here's this thing that god did he wanted all future generations to remember it to know about it and to keep it and so uh he made a he commanded that a poppy made that some some of that uh an omer full of it might be kept and the purpose of that whole thing was to be a testimony to future generations. And he laid it up before the testimony, um, which is the contents of the ark of the testimony, which we'll get to a little bit later. But notice a couple things. It, it is to be kept, and it has to do with other people who weren't there seeing and knowing and understanding uh, what had happened. Right, so you have children. You should uh, the, these children of Israel. They have children uh, after they finish the forty years or in the promised land. They have children, and so their command, the command that God gave them, is to teach their children what happened, to explain it to them, to show them, and say, "Look, we even have this." And when they don't believe you, say, "Here's this this omer of uh, manna that we kept, uh, so you can see, so you can see the bread that we ate for forty years." See. See, because you're supposed to pass those things on to your children. And your children are supposed to receive them and pass them on to their children. Amen. All right, turn a couple uh, pages over to Exodus 25. I'm going to try to move a little bit quickly because we got a lot to cover. Exodus 25. Exodus 25 and look down in verse 20. Uh, and the cherubim shall... These are the cherubim's... Uh, on the two ends of the mercy seat on the ark of the testimony uh, verse 20 and the cherubim shall stretch forth their wings on high covering the mercy seat with their wings and their faces shall look one to another toward the mercy seat shall the faces of the cherubims be and thou shalt put the mercy seat above upon the ark so it's on top of the ark upon it above it and in the ark thou shalt put the testimony that I shall give thee. And there I will meet with thee, and I will commune with thee from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubims which are upon the ark of the testimony, of all the things which I will give thee in, the, in commandment unto the children of Israel. So according to this passage... The testimony is all the things which I will give thee in commandment unto the children of Israel. That's the law and the prophets and the Psalms. That's Genesis uh, through Malachi, not in that order in the Hebrew Old Testament, but in that order in your Bible, amen, the King James Bible. And those things are called the testimony. And they sit inside the ark of the testimony. And they're to be kept, and it is there that God meets with them. You say, where's that? Where the Word of God is. Where the Word of God is. The testimony that I shall give thee of all things 
uh, which I will give thee in commandment unto the children of Israel. Alright, turn the chapter over to chapter 26. Exodus 26, look down at verse 33. And thou shalt hang upon the veil, that's the veil between the holy place and the holy of holies, the thing that separates uh, you from the presence of God. And thou shalt hang upon the veil under the tax that which mayest bring in th- that thou mayest bring in thither within the veil the ark of the testimony. And the veil shall divide unto you between the holy place and the most holy. And thou shalt put the mercy seat upon the ark of the testimony in the most holy place. And thou shalt set the table without the veil, and the candlestick over against the table on the side of the tabernacle toward the south, and thou shalt put the table on the north side. Now there's all kind of typology here in the tabernacle, which I don't understand and therefore can't get into. Uh, But one of the things that God has shown me about these things is that the Ark of the Testimony, the Ark which contains the testimony, the Ark which contains... All things which were given in commandment unto the children of Israel by the Lord. The ark which contains the law which is the testimony of God. What God says is inside of the veil in the holy of holy place where God says uh, it's there where I will meet with you. Not out in the holy place but in the most holy place. And so you uh, look over in the New Testament and you find out that we find grace to enter in the time of need. That we can enter boldly into the throne of grace by the blood of Jesus Christ. Within the veil. Inside the veil. See? That's where the Word of God is. That's where you meet God. You don't say that you have a relationship with God if you have no relationship with these words. What kind of relationship you think you have with a God who you've never uh, heard from or talked to? Uh, The Bible says, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Amen. All right. Uh, Turn over to Numbers chapter 17. Uh, Excuse me, before that, Exodus uh, 30, a couple chapters over, Exodus 30. And look down in verse 6. Exodus 30, and look down at verse 6. Uh, Actually, back up to verse uh, 1. Let's start in verse 1. And thou shalt make an altar to burn incense upon. Of shittim wood shalt thou make it. A cubit shall be the length thereof, and a cubit the breadth thereof. Four square shall it be. This is the altar. Uh... And two cubits shall be the height thereof, the horns thereof shall be of the same, and thou shalt overlay it with pure gold, the top thereof, and the sides thereof round about, and the horns thereof, and thou shalt make unto it a crown of gold round about. And two golden rings shalt thou make uh, to it, under the crown of it, by the two corners thereof, upon the two sides of it shalt thou make it, and they shall be for places for the staves to bear it withal. And thou shalt make the staves of shittim wood, and overlay them with gold. And thou shalt put it before the veil that is by the ark of the test. And thou shalt put it before the veil that is by the ark of the testimony, before the mercy seat that is over the testimony, where I will meet with thee. So God meets with you, uh, children of Israel, in this case, but in type, in type us as a pattern of what would come. He meets with you at the mercy seat, which is above uh, where the law is kept, where the testimony is kept in the Ark of the Testimony, uh, popularly referred to as the Ark of the Covenant, but here called the Ark of the Testimony. And it's called the Ark of the Testimony because its purpose is to carry and to hold the testimony, which is the things that God has said. The things that God has commanded, the report of what God has done, the prophecy of what he will do. We'll look more about that uh, as we go. But I want you to notice that he says he'll meet with you there. 
And where where is that? Where the, uh, the the testimony? Where's the testimony? Inside the ark, below the mercy seat. Um, and the here we we read about the altar, and the altar is before uh, all these things. It shall put it before the veil that is by the ark of the testimony, before the mercy seat that is over the testimony, where I will meet with thee. See, so there's an order and a sequence by which you have to approach things. Uh, when you get studying the tabernacle, this this is the prayer altar, uh, but there's another altar where sacrifice is to be made, and that's not even inside the holy place. That's outside uh, the tent of the tabernacle. Um, and so you have to offer sacrifice and get yourself cleaned up um, before you can even enter the tabernacle. And as you travel westward into the holy place, uh, and then into the most holy place where the word of God is, uh, there's these things that are necessary for you to learn. Now, God will speak to you. God will learn. Uh, God will help you to learn. Uh, God will woo you. God will encourage you. God will preach at you when you're messing up. God will reprove you. God will rebuke you. God will correct you. Uh, and God will uh, speak softly to you. Whatever is needed, he knows what's needed. But you have to obey to get to this place uh, where there's mercy. You need to call out to God and ask for mercy in order to receive it. And if you want to meet with him, that's inside the veil. That is to say, his flesh, which was crucified for us. So in order to meet with God, in order to have fellowship with Jesus Christ and God the Father, you have to go through the veil uh, to where the word of God is kept. See? And this is the basis of your fellowship, uh, the, the, uh, the blood of Jesus Christ, which cleanses us from all sin, and the word of God, which is the testimony of God, which is kept in the ark of the testimony under the mercy seat. And it's God's mercy that uh, you can have it. Amen. All right, that's verse 6. Look down in verse, uh, oh, let's see, 26. And thou shalt anoint the tabernacle of the congregation therewith, and the ark of the testimony, and the table and all his vessels, and the candlestick and his vessels, and the altar of incense. So all these things that were uh, anointed with this ointment, described in verse 23, uh, take, also, take thou also unto the principal spices of myrrh, and of, of pure myrrh, 500 shekels, and of sweet cinnamon, Half so much, even 250 shekels, and of sweet calamus, 250 shekels, and of cassia, 500 shekels, over the shekel of the sanctuary, and of oil, olive, and hen. And thou shalt make it an oil of holy ointment, an ointment compound after the art of the apothecary, and it shall be an holy anointing oil. And that oil doesn't only anoint the tabernacle and all the things in it, it anoints the ark of the testimony where the testimony of God is kept. And there's other things in there too. Uh, you can study out. But right now we're talking about the word testimony. Alright, look down in verse uh, 36. And thou shalt beat some of it very small. This is the uh, confection after the art of the apothecary. That's described in verse 34. And thou shalt beat some of it very small and put of it before the testimony in the tabernacle of the congregation, where I will meet with thee, it shall be unto you most holy. See? So all these things, the tabernacle, the um, the ark, the mercy seat, and the testimony in the tabernacle of the congregation, where he meets with you, he says, it shall be unto you most holy. That's why we have the words, Holy Bible on the front of our Bibles. Because to us, this book is holy. And it's holy whether you think it is or not, or whether you consider it to be or not. But he commands you to, to consider this book as being holy. The holy words of the living God, the expression is. Amen? All right, turn to Exodus 31. Exodus 31, look down in verse... Uh, Oh, let's see. Look in verse six. Look at verse fifteen. Six days may work be done, but in the seventh is the Sabbath of rest, 
holy to the Lord, whosoever doeth any work in the Sabbath day, he shall surely be put to death. Whereof the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations for a perpetual covenant. It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. Okay, so we know that story, right? That's a famous story. Everybody knows it about the Sabbath. And that is not Sunday. That's Saturday. Uh, look at verse 18. And he gave unto Moses, and he gave unto Moses when he made when he had made an end of communing with him upon Mount Sinai, two tables of testimony, tables of stone, written with the finger of God. See? So whatever God said that was on these stones, that God wrote with his finger, it says in the verse, were kept in the Ark of the Testimony. But I want you to pay close attention to this word testimony, Two tables of testimony, tables of stone, written with the finger of God. So the Ten Commandments, the law uh, that God said, and frankly all the words of God, were kept in the Ark of the Testimony. It's called the Ark of the Testimony because God's words are his testimony of what he says. Uh, the Bible says in one place, we'll get to it later, but the testimony of Jesus Christ is the spirit of prophecy. Uh, because, uh, because Jesus Christ told us the future from what he had seen. He testified to us things to come. What God says, what he reports, what he says about history, what he says about reality, what he says about the present, what he says about the future, what he says about your nature. That is God's testimony on all matters, which are to be found in this book. So in a courtroom, people throw that word around. They say, well, let's hear the testimony. And Jesus talked about it. He's written in your law, the test mouth of two or three witnesses, shall every word be established. And the testimony of two men is true. So if you get two, two or three people to agree in something that is to be held as true under the law, according to the law, and he used that in the arguments uh, that he made uh, to try to convince people to believe on him. And he came unto his own, and his own received him not. But the Bible calls his words, the, he calls the, the tabernacle the tabernacle of testimony. He calls the ark the ark of the testimony. He calls the veil the veil of the testimony. And he calls uh, the tabernacle also called a tent in some places. He calls it the tent of testimony. And those uh, verses are Exodus 38, 21, uh, Numbers 1, 50, Exodus 40, verses 3, Exodus 40, verses 3 and 5, Leviticus 24, uh, verse 3, and Numbers 9 and verse 15. And you can, um, I have those written down. You can look them up later. Um, or copy them over, but testimony. Testimony is are the things that God says. And so, you know, you say that you saw this or that, or you bear record and say this or that about what happened. Uh, you were an eyewitness to a car crash or something, and so you report to the to the police officer how it happened. Uh, you get an argument with someone, and, and it turns into a fight, and you got to appear before a judge, and you testify before the judge. Uh, your uh, opinion of what happened or in your testimony uh, your testimony is what you say just like God's testimony is what he says and when it comes to you what you say may be true it may not be true and in fact the Bible says let God be true and every man a liar but every man a liar so what God says is always true and there's always some admixture of lie in the things that you say, man, because you're a liar. Just like me. Amen. Alright, turn to the book of Ruth. Uh, Ruth chapter 4. Joshua judges uh, the first five books. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers. Then Joshua, then judges. Then Ruth. Uh, Ruth chapter 4. 
<clears throat> Ruth chapter 4 and look down in verse uh, 7. Now this was the manner in former time in Israel concerning redeeming and concerning changing. For to confirm all things, a man plucked off his shoe and gave it to his neighbor. And this was a testimony in Israel. In Israel. So testimony. Uh, if you plucked off your shoe and, it, and you gave it to someone, that had meaning. That was saying that whatever agreement that you had with him that had to do with redeeming something, in this case uh, the kinsman redeemer uh, uh, with Boaz and Ruth, uh, or in other cases, uh, any other custom, but concerning redeeming and concerning changing. like uh, So if property changes hands or if uh, in this case, a wife uh, changes hands because the brother died. Uh, for to confirm all things. It's a confirmation that the deal is sealed. See? For a testimony in Israel, he said. And this was a testimony in Israel. So a testimony is something that seals something. It's something that uh, confirms that your agreement is set, that we're going to move forward with this, that it's that it's uh, that it's legal, that it's going to happen, and uh, you can take God's testimony with regard to His words along those same lines. If God said it, it's true. If God said in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters, and God said. Let there be light, and there was light. You can take that as gospel, my friend. You can take that as absolute truth. You can take that to the bank. You can bet money on it, and you'll win every time if someone disagrees. And everything he said about the past, everything he said about the present, everything he said about the future, everything he's ever said about science, about philosophy, about education, about true love and marriage, about relationships, about government, about people... Everything he has ever said in every uh, aspect and in every category is absolute truth. Thy word is truth, Jesus said. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. All right, turn to Psalm 19. Psalm 19. I know it may seem like it, but we're not actually looking at every occurrence of the word, although I did. Um, in preparing for this message, and that's what you should do when you're studying and preparing. Uh, Psalm 19, and look down in verse uh, 7. Uh, I'm in 119. We want Psalm 19, and look down in verse 7. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. That's the Word of God, able to, to convert you. That's... Uh, that's uh, Romans. That's Romans uh, one fifteen. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God and the salvation to everyone that believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. That's uh, 2 Timothy three. That thou from a child hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise in the salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. Unlike you, friend, unlike you, Christian, unlike you, preacher, the Word of God is not mixed with some admixture of corruption and error. The law of the Lord is perfect! Thank God. Converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord, that's what God says, that's God's report, that's the record of what God says, is sure. Making wise the simple. The entrance of thy words giveth light. It giveth understanding unto the simple, he said. And these commandments, by the way, uh, the testimony of the Lord, unlike testimony in Korah, is not just facts. It's not just, uh, uh, I saw the car go by, it was a red car. Or it started raining, it rained heavily. And there's an expression, just the facts, ma'am, just the facts. Don't tell me your opinion, don't tell me your uh, perspective. Don't tell me whether or not you think he's guilty. You just give me the facts of what you observed, see? But the Bible is more than just facts. It is straight up, flat out, telling you God's opinion on the matter. 
which is absolute truth. Well, you're lazy. Well, that's your opinion. Well, if you read it in the Word of God, it's it's what God says. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. It is certain. It is utterly and completely reliable. It is not capable of error or being corrupted. Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life, he said. And if you're without the word of God, then you're without understanding. If you're without the word of God and you don't have it and you don't know it, then you're without knowledge. Uh, you say, I'm not without knowledge. I got five college degrees and I'm a doctor of medicine or I'm a doctor of science or I'm a doctor of philosophy and I've read all these books and I studied this and this and this and this. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, the Bible says. And this book is the only source of knowledge, of absolute truth and knowledge. Turn to Isaiah chapter 8. Isaiah chapter 8. And look down in verse, uh, let's start in verse 5. The Lord spake also unto me again, saying, For as much as this people refuseth the waters of Shiloh that go softly and rejoice in Rezin and Ramalia's son, now therefore behold, the Lord bringeth up upon them the waters of the river, strong and many, even the king of Assyria, in all his glory, and he shall come up over all his channels and go over all his banks, and he shall pass through Judah, he shall overflow and go over. He shall reach even to the neck, and the stretching out of his wings shall fill the breadth of thy land, O Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. We read about it in the New Testament. But here it's used uh, uh, to address Israel. Look at verse 9. Associate yourselves, O ye people, and ye shall be broken in pieces. And give ear, all ye of far countries. Gird yourselves, and ye shall be broken in pieces. Gird yourselves, and ye shall be broken in pieces. He says it twice, just to make sure you heard him. See? Well, I wish you'd just stop talking. You just talk too much. You've been hammering us. You said this, you said this, you said this. You said the same thing over and over again. I want to make sure you heard me. I want to make sure you heard me. Look at verse 10. Take counsel together, and it shall come to naught. Speak the word, and it shall not stand, for God is with us. See, he's addressing the enemies of Israel. And he's saying, you go ahead, and you counsel together, and you make your little plans, and you prepare, and you gird on your armor, you uh, gird, gird up yourself like a man, and you talk together, and you counsel together, and you conspire together, you associate yourselves together, you make allies and unions and a whole one world government, and what that's going to result in, in verses, is verses 9 and 10. Broken in pieces, broken in pieces, and shall not stand, for God is with us. See? That is the truth of all your unity in one worldness. That's your truth of your ecumenicism. Look at verse 11. For the Lord spake thus, to me with a strong hand it instructed me see that with a strong he strong armed me <laughs> he spake to me strongly <laughs> with a strong hand he says that's not a reference to something that he did that's a reference to his speech to the way that God talked to Isaiah with these things go ahead and associate yourselves together he pressed it upon him strongly I want to make sure he heard. I want to make sure he remembered. Make sure he kept it and passed it on. And instructed me that I should not walk in the way of this people, saying, Say ye not a confederacy to all them to whom this people shall say, A confederacy, neither fear ye their fear, nor be afraid. Sanctify the Lord of hosts himself, and let him be your fear, and let him be your dread. And he shall be for a sanctuary, and for a stone of stumbling, and for a rock of offense. We read about that 
over and over in the New Testament. Uh, in Romans uh, 9, in Romans 10, in Romans 11. Uh, to both the houses of Israel, that's uh, Israel and Judah, which will be one house um, in the millennium, for a gin and for a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And many among them shall stumble and fall and be broken and be snared and be taken. Bind up the testimony. Say what testimony? What he just said. Bind it up. Seal the law among my disciples. Bind it up and seal it among my disciples, he said. So if you walk with the Lord, if you're a servant of the Lord, you're supposed to bind up these words. Bind them to your heart. Hide God's thy word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. If a man love me, he will keep my words. This is a principle that was taught to the children of Israel over and over again throughout the Old Testament. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Notice he didn't just say Israel shall not live by bread alone, although that's who he was dealing with at the time, when he, who he said the verse to. He said man shall not live. So when we get to the New Testament, we can apply that verse to the rest of us who are not Israel. Gentiles. Bind up the testimony and seal the law among my disciples. Seal it. Make it sure. Make sure you know it. Make sure you understand it. Make sure you got it in the depths of your soul. Make sure you can recite it in case they take it from you. And notice that the law is the testimony. Specifically, the things that he just said, the things that God just testified, that God reported, that God prophesied, that God promised, that God spoke. He said, don't worry about what all them other jokers and what they're trying to do and what they're saying. All their power is going to come to naught. Verse 10. They're going to be broken in pieces. Verse 9. For all their joining together, it won't stand. Because you and I serve Jesus Christ, the God of the universe, the God who is greater than the universe, the God who inhabits eternity, the God whose words are eternal and incorruptible. Amen? Testimony. Notice so far we're in Isaiah, uh, more than halfway through the Bible, and not one time does the word testimony ever refer so far to your own goodness or your own righteousness, or your righteousness before men. The word testimony uh, occurs, I think, like 78 times in the Bible. Testimonies, not including testimonies. Uh, the word testimony. Thy testimonies also are my delight and my counselors, he said. Thy testimonies, he said in Psalm 119. Meaning that the things that God has said are the were the delight in the counselors of David. Not your best friend that you work with who is full of beans and doesn't know the Bible. Uh, not your father or your uncle who doesn't know the Bible or who lies about the Bible. Not your family or your friends or your relationships or some famous preacher on TV. Not Charles Stanley. Not Joel Osteen. And frankly, not Billy Graham, not not certainly not Franklin Graham or his daughter preacher, whatever her name is. Do the, thy, te, thy testimonies also are my delight, and my counselors. The things that God said are what matters, are the truth, are the thing things that are going to come to pass, the things that are true. All right, uh, turn over to Psalm seventy-eight. Psalm seventy-eight. We'll see that again. Psalm 78, and look down in verse 5. For he established, uh, actually start in verse 1. Give ear, O my people, to my law. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. So the law is the words of his mouth. Meaning the things that are written in this book are the things that God has said, literally proceeding out of his mouth. Here called the words of his mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings of old, which we have heard and known. 
and our fathers have told us. See, how do you think you get the word of God? You get it from your fathers. You get it's it's meant to be passed down from father to son. I'm preaching to you, Dad. You don't get you don't cast your pearls before swine and give your children over to the world by sending them to public school. Well, they'll hear where they will hear and soak up nothing but hatred for God and abhorrence for the Word of God. Now, from your father, you ought to hear the Word of God. You ought to hear it, which we have heard and known from our father and our fathers have told us. We will not hide them from their children. Showing to the generation to come the praises of the Lord and his strength and his wonderful works that he hath done. See, not just facts. Praises, strength, wonderful works, all of which are included uh, in God's testimony. Look at verse 5. For he established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers that they should make them known to their children that the generation to come might know them, even the children which should be born, who should arise and declare them to their children, that they might set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep His commandments. It might not be as their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation that set their heart aright, that set not their heart aright, and whose spirit was not steadfast with God, the children of Ephraim, being armed and carrying bows, turned back in the day of battle. They kept not the covenant of God and refused to walk in his law and forgot his works and his wonders that he had shown them. Marvelous things did he in the sight of their fathers in the land of Egypt in the field of Zoan. And then it goes on to list all the marvelous things that he did where he proved his love for them and his promises for them and his protection and the, and the personal things that God gave them man to man that they passed on to their children but didn't follow. And every time you don't uh, follow, you corrupt your children, you steal from them, you don't give them an example of the words that you preach. You want your children to know the things of God? You need to teach them. He established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel. See? And don't ever stop doing that, amen? You know, when they get older, they start resisting. They start thinking they're, um, you know, smart and independent and, and don't need to hear the, uh, the weird ideas of, uh, I'm talking about just 90% of, of all children who grow up and when they turn 18, all right, I'm on my own. I guess I don't need to listen to you no more. Well, amen, if, if, if your dad gave you everything he had to give you before that time. But that's not how it goes in this book. Turn to Psalm 81, look in verse 4. For this was a statute in Israel, uh, speaking about the new moon and the solemn feast day in verse 3. Uh, and the singing in verse 1. This was a statute in Israel and a law of the God of Jacob. Verse 4. This he ordained in Joseph for a testimony. See? It's not just random singing. It's, 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 it has a purpose. Its purpose is to declare things that he wants the hearers to know about. This he ordained in Joseph for a testimony when he went out through the land of Egypt where I heard a language that I understood not. I removed his shoulder from the burden. His hands were delivered from the pots. Thou callest him in trouble, and I delivered thee. I answered thee in the secret place of thunder. I proved thee at the waters of Meribah. Selah. Hear, O my people, and I will testify unto thee, O Israel, if thou wilt hearken unto me. There shall no strange God be in thee, neither shalt thou worship any strange God. I am the Lord thy God, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt. Open thy mouth wide, and I will fill it. Say, what's that? That's God testifying to these people of the things that he's done, so that they know about them. So that they know all those times in your life, Dad, that God took care of you, that God provided you for you, that you walked with God, that you lived by faith. That you stepped off and did something wrong and whatsoever man so it, that shall you also reap. That you warned your children not to follow in that same path. But 
but my people would not hearken to my voice, and Israel would none of me. See? See what he says? He equates you not listening to the words of my mouth with not wanting anything to do with me. Verse 11. Because your relationship with God is your relationship with his words. Amen? All right, turn to Psalm 119. Psalm 119. But what God says is sure, it's certain, you can count on it. Why won't you give yourself over to his words? Why won't you memorize them? Why is, why is every other, uh, detail, every business, every, uh, every flight of your, and fancy of your mind, every distraction, every butterfly, as my wife says, more important than the testimonies of God's mouth? Psalm 119, verse 88. Quicken me after thy loving kindness. So shall I keep the testimony of thy mouth, uh, David commits to God in prayer. Look at verse 106, I have sworn and I will perform it, that I will keep thy righteous judgments. Uh, you do well to memorize this, this chapter, amen. My son, just, my son Daniel just finished memorizing it, and good on him, amen. And uh, praise the Lord for it. But even something good like that, is a testimony to the Lord. It's a testimony of God's grace. It is a testimony of God being able to do something in you. It's a testimony that the words of the New Testament are true. And he said, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. That the words of the New Testament are true. And he said, always having all sufficiency in all things, that ye may abound unto every good work. That the, that, that the, that the testimony of God in the New Testament is true when he said, my grace is sufficient for thee, and my strength is made perfect in weakness. Turn to Psalm 122. Psalm 122. Psalm 122. And look down in verse uh, 4. Whither the tribes go up, the tribes of the Lord, unto the testimony of Israel, to give thanks unto the name of the Lord. So, the te they go up to give thanks. Where do they go? They go to the testimony of Israel. What's the testimony of Israel? God's words, which are kept in the ark of the testimony, in the tent of the testimony. Behind, on the other side of the veil of testimony. <laughs> you see how important God's words are? How they're related to every other thing that has to do with God? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Alright, so testimony so far is what God says. It's God's, uh, testimony on the matter. It's God's, uh, statement that he makes to the police about what happened it's what god says testimony not not uh not your in fact in fact it's not your goodness at all the bible god's testimony about your righteousness is that you have none there is none righteous no not one he said there is none that understandeth there is none that seeketh after god they are together become unprofitable uh, over there in, in Romans chapter 3 uh, and Isaiah. All right, turn to Matthew chapter 8. Matthew chapter 8, and look down in verse uh, 1. When he was come down from the mountain, great multitudes followed him. And behold, there came a leper and worshipped him, saying, Lord, if thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. And Jesus put forth his hand and touched him, saying, I will, be thou clean. And immediately his leprosy was cleansed. And Jesus saith unto him, See thou tell no man, but go thy way, and show thyself to the priests, and offer the gift that Moses commanded for a testimony unto them. See? So you go do this thing, keep the law, offer the gift that Moses commanded to the, to the priests, and you do that for a testimony unto them. Uh, so that has to do with what those other people think. Uh, but telling them uh, what happened, not just letting them think whatever they want to, uh, but keeping the law for a testimony unto them. 
uh, turn a couple chapters over. Sometimes uh, in preaching and these matters of walking with the Lord, uh, what you do and what you say is a testimony unto somebody. Like, I'm here, I got a message from God, I'm delivering it to you. Uh, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. That's the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it's a gospel of promise, of hope, and it's sure and certain if you uh, uh, believe it. But sometimes uh, testimony is against somebody. Turn to Matthew chapter 10 and look down in verse uh, 16. Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. But beware of men, for they will deliver you up to the councils, and they will scourge you in their synagogues, and ye shall be brought before governors and kings for my sake, for a testimony, a testimony against them and the Gentiles. Which tells me that when you get up there, you're, 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 you're not there to give them a message of hope necessarily. You're there to testify against them. Um, not you, uh, Christian. This is obviously technically dispensational. Its application it has to do with Jews being uh, called in the tribulation, called up before government councils and in the synagogues and scourged and whipped. Look at verse 19. But when they deliver you up, take no thought how or what ye shall speak, for it shall be given you in that same hour what ye shall speak. For it is not ye that speak, but the Spirit of your Father which speaketh in you. And the brother shall deliver up the brother unto death, and the father the child, and the children shall rise up against their parents and cause them to be put to death. And ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake, but he that endureth to the end shall be saved. So that's uh, Matthew 24, the, the gospel of the kingdom. This is uh, the disciples, uh, Jewish disciples in the tribulation. And it gives instruction on what to do. And it has to do with speaking before the court that you're called in front of. Uh, and it says here, a testimony against them and the Gentiles. Just like uh, John the Baptist. It's not right that you should have your brother's wife, he said. Off with his head. See, that's a testimony against them. All right, turn to John 3. Uh, John 3. A testimony is a witness. And as a Christian, you're supposed to be a witness. Uh, you're supposed to give an answer. You're supposed to report the things that you have seen and heard concerning Jesus Christ. It has nothing to do with your own goodness or your own righteousness. Turn to John chapter 3. Uh, and look down in verse, uh, let's see, 20, 25. Then there arose a question between some of John's disciples and the Jews about purifying. And they came unto John and said unto him, Rabbi, he that was with thee beyond Jordan, to whom thou bearest witness, behold, the same baptizes, and all men uh, come to him. So Jesus Christ is baptizing people, and all men are coming to him, uh, in the words of the verse. And somebody uh, comes up to Jesus and, and asks him about, or unto John, rather, and uh, reports it to him. John answered and said, A man can receive nothing except it be given him from heaven. And I've taught you about that before. Ye yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but that I am sent before him. See, John's testimony was not about himself. It was about Jesus Christ. It was not about his own goodness. It was about Jesus Christ. It was not about his own righteousness. It was about Jesus Christ. It was not about his miracles. It was not about his baptism. He said, he must increase, but I must decrease. The life and the ministry of John the Baptist was pointing to Jesus Christ. Say, what's that? That's testimony. He testified of Christ, not of himself. Look at verse 29. He that hath the bride is the bridegroom. That's Jesus Christ. We're the bride. But the friend of the bridegroom, that's John the Baptist, which standeth and heareth him, rejoiceth greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. 
This my joy, therefore, is fulfilled. He must increase, but I must decrease. He that cometh from above is above all. He that is of the earth is earthy, and speaketh of the earth. He that cometh from heaven is above all. And what he hath, speaking of Jesus Christ, he that cometh from heaven, and what he hath seen, Jesus Christ, and heard, Jesus Christ, that he testifieth, Jesus Christ, and no man receiveth his testimony. He that receiveth his testimony has set to his seal that God is true. See, you believe on Jesus Christ, you're saying that God is true, that God's promise of sending the Messiah was true. Uh, that prophet uh, in the Old Testament, in the, in the book of Moses, look at verse 34. For he whom God has sent speaketh the words of God, for God giveth not the Spirit by measure unto him. The Father loveth the Son, and hath given all things into his hand. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. See, That's a testimony. That's John the Baptist's testimony of Jesus Christ. And John the Baptist reporting that the testimony of Jesus Christ was the were the very words that God told him to say. A testimony is a witness. It's a report. Uh, turn to John chapter 5. The Bible talks in Corinthians about how you have the ministry of reconciliation and the word of reconciliation. The Bible says, if any man speak, let him speak as of the oracles of God. You want to open your mouth and give your opinion to somebody? Let it be a Bible verse that comes out of your mouth. And how are you going to do that if you won't hide it in your heart? John chapter 5, and look down in verse 30. I can of, this is uh, Jesus Christ. I can of mine own self do nothing, as I hear, I judge. And my judgment is just, because I seek not my own will, but the will of the Father which has sent me. If I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. There is another that beareth witness of me, and I know that the witness which he witnesses of me is true. Ye sent unto John, and he bear witness unto the truth. That's what we just read over there in John chapter 3. But I receive not testimony from men. See? But these things I say that ye might be saved. He was a burning and a shining light, and ye were willing for a season to rejoice in, in his light. But I have a greater witness than that of John, for the works which the Father hath given me to finish, the same works that I do bear witness of me, that the Father has sent me. And the Father himself which hath sent me hath borne witness of me. Ye have neither heard his voice at any time nor seen his shape. And ye have not his word abiding in you for whom he has sent. Him ye believe not. Search the scriptures for in them ye think ye have eternal life. And they are they, that is the scriptures, which testify of me. See? John the Baptist testified of Jesus Christ. God the Father testified of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ did not testify of himself. He testified of God the Father. And he spoke the words that God the Father gave him to speak. And the works that he did bear witness of him that the Father has sent him. Which means that there are two components to your testimony, Christian. There are the words that come out of your mouth, which should be these words, the King James Bible in English. And there is the way that you live your life in accordance with these words. But, in a, but, the, but these words say that uh, our right, even our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. Even these words say that uh, if we say that we have no sin, we lie and do not the truth. We deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. The Bible says in 1 John. See, we're supposed to report and to testify of what these words say, and we're supposed to live our lives in accordance with these words. But living your life in accordance with these words does not just mean that you always do right. It means you always try to do right. But it means that you don't self-righteously lie and say that you always do right. Because in so doing... You steal from Jesus Christ the testimony of His work 
in forgiving you every time you sin. 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You, you bear false witness against Jesus Christ in favor of your own self-righteousness, which is a lying testimony before men. See? Because your testimony is not about you. It's about what Jesus Christ does in you. And what he does for you. And what he does with you. And what he said in these words. No, but you're the, you're the, not you though. You're the guy who thinks he's better than everybody else. You're the guy who, who prays uh, to God and says, thank God that I'm not his other man. I tithe. I go to church. I help old ladies across the street. I do good works. And Christian, you should do good works. But your good works are not a testimony of yourself. They are a testimony of what Jesus Christ did in you. And when you mess up and fail and he forgives you, that is also a testimony of what Jesus Christ did in you. And when your brethren brethren forgive you like they're supposed to, that is a testimony of what Jesus Christ did in them for you. By this shall all men know that you're my disciples, that you have love one toward another. But you're too busy stealing from Jesus Christ in favor of your own self-righteousness to bear witness of the truth. Which is, we serve a God who forgives. Which is God's love. Grace that is greater than all our sin. Grace, grace, marvelous grace. Grace that will pardon and cleanse within. Where's that in your testimony? Since you haven't sinned in 20 years. (laughs) Christian. You should confess your sins every night to Jesus Christ. Amen. The, turn to First Corinthians. Uh, actually, turn to Acts 14. Uh, we'll go through these quickly. Acts 14. And look down at verse 33. I know it always sounds like I'm getting hard on a certain category of people and, and uh, preaching hard against somebody. I'm preaching against myself just as much as anybody else. I want people to think I'm a good guy. I have a tendency to try to conceal things. And I'm not saying that every little private wicked thought in your heart should be exposed, although you should confess it to God. But but what should be what should be exposed is that you are not perfect, that you are a sinner, and that and that day by day and with each passing moment, part of him providing for you and gr- having grace for you to abound into every good work is to make a mechanism to forgive the sins that you commit over and over again every day as a dog uh, returns to his own vomit. You should b- have a testimony of, yeah, I messed up, but God forgave me. And I'm trying as hard as I can. And amen, if, yeah, God delivered me and I was able to escape that sin that time. But don't kid me, Christian. You may have escaped that time, but you didn't the next day or the day after. Or maybe it wasn't that sin. Maybe it was a different sin. But whatever it was, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. All right, Acts 14, look down in verse uh, 33. Um... Yeah, I got the wrong verse. Uh, 14. Okay, well, let's skip over that one. Turn to 1 Corinthians 1. 1 Corinthians 1. You have a responsibility, Christian, to testify to the world what you've seen and heard about Jesus Christ. To report what you've read in these words. In that they, in that these words are true, that they are effectual, that they work in you effectually if you believe them, and that God will save you, and all the other things that it says. First uh, Corinthians one. Uh, look down in verse. Let's see, verse four. I thank my God always on your behalf for the grace of God which is given you by Jesus Christ. So there's testimony 
that God has given his grace to these people he's writing to, which is you, Christian, Church of Corinth, <laughs> that in everything ye are enriched by him in all utterance and in all knowledge, testimony of what God's done for them, enriched by him in utterance and knowledge, that's things that they speak and what they know. Verse 6, even as the testimony of, Je of Christ, even as the testimony of Christ, was confirmed in you. See? The things that God has said about Jesus Christ are confirmed in these people in which Jesus Christ lives. Remember Galatians 2.20? I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Look at verse 7. So that, and this is how he's confirmed, so that ye come behind in no gift, waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Is that what you're waiting for? Who shall also confirm you unto the end, that ye may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful, by whom ye were called into the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Notice, God is the one who's faithful to confirm you in these things, not you yourself. Don't steal from God. Don't be self-righteous, Christian. Alright, there are many other things that we can cover. But never in the entire Bible is your testimony a reference to your own righteousness. The testimony of, of Jesus Christ is the spirit of prophecy. And most of the references to testimony uh, in the word of God is a reference to, to speaking or hearing or reporting the word of God. Which is today... Every word in the English King James Bible as we have it. And read it and memorize it. Amen. All right. Uh, let's close in a word of prayer. Dear God, we thank you so much for your many blessings. I thank you for this lesson you've given us about testimony. Pray that you help us to always understand it properly according to your words. Um, be with us as we go. Uh, uh, if there's any who's not saved, help them to get saved. Pray for everybody on the tape uh, that you'd encourage and strengthen them in your words, that you confirm them in Jesus Christ, that you give them assurance of salvation, and that you teach them uh, how to memorize the Bible. It's in Jesus Christ's name I pray. Amen.